So we have a Supreme Court that's out of control, legislating from the bench, which Republicans said judges weren't supposed to do. You have Supreme Court justices like Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito flagrantly violating basic ethical guidelines. And Democrats, well, Democrats as ever, on the judicial front, not being as aggressive as they perhaps could be in response. Although, to be fair, one Democrat, Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, has been a loud and eloquent critic of this Supreme Court. As a member of both the Judiciary Committee and chair of the Judiciary Court Subcommittee, the Democratic senator has been working to reform our justice system, especially the ethics-free zone surrounding the highest court in the land. The United States Supreme Court is the only court in the country not covered by an ethics code, and worse than that, it's the only part of the federal government that has no process for ethics investigation and enforcement. None. People who are concerned about ethics violations over at the court have to get pretty creative because the court has no place to submit an ethics complaint. If you like, there's no inbox. And now, after years of speaking about the issue on the floor of the Senate, Senator Whitehouse has launched a new podcast called Making the Case. The podcast, which is available on Spotify and Apple, aims to, quote, shine a light on the far-right scheme to capture the Supreme Court, or as Whitehouse calls it, the court that dark money built. The first episode features Slate magazine senior editor Dahlia Lithwick, among others, discussing the right's initial push to take control of the court. In 1971, uh, shortly before he becomes a justice of the Supreme Court, Lewis Powell writes a memo essentially saying, hey, you know what would be really easy to do? It would be really easy to kind of capture the Supreme Court for business interests. It's not a hard thing to do. And we can, with concerted effort, make sure that business wins all the time at the court. And here's the kind of handy little playbook to do it. And 50 years later, it's worked. We have a captured Supreme Court. So I'll ask again, Democrats, what are you going to do about it? Joining me now, Democratic Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Senator, first it was Clarence Thomas accepting undeclared flights and gifts from a right-wing billionaire who also bought his mother's house. Now this week we learned again from ProPublica that Justice Alito accepted a private flight and vacation from another right-wing billionaire whose company later came before the court and got a favorable opinion from Alito. What is worse in your view, the accepting of the gifts the non-declaration of the gifts, or the rushing to the Wall Street Journal op-ed page to deny he did anything wrong? Well, I think the rushing to the Wall Street Journal editorial page was a massive pratfall and backfire for Justice Alito. So if he wants to keep doing that, you know, God bless him. But the <laughs> arguments that he made were so bad that yep. if they were presented to him as a judge, he'd probably throw the person who was making those arguments out of court. So that pretty much blew up. I think the key point here is these, the common elements in this operation. You have a right-wing activist billionaire, you have a Federalist Society justice, you have extravagant gifts of yes. travel, yeah. you have untoward secrecy, and you have Leonard Leo. And those exist both in the Alito and in the Thomas uh, scenarios and those are scenarios that shouldn't exist. Yes. And Leonard Leo being, of course, uh, the man who is credited on the right for creating this 6-3 uh, supermajority. Um, at what point do Senate Democrats, does your Judiciary Committee, drag Roberts, Thomas, Alito in front of a Senate hearing to account for these flagrantly unethical and possibly illegal activities. Your committee hasn't even invited Thomas, let alone subpoenaed him. Do you understand, Senator, why a lot of Democratic voters, a lot of people in your base in particular, are so frustrated with your party sometimes? Uh, absolutely. And um, <laughs> I spent a lot of time sharing that frustration. Uh, but we are working forward both through the Finance Committee and through the Judiciary Committee on an investigative plan and implementation of that plan to get to the bottom of this. The first thing you want to do is find out what the facts are. We did not know about this Alito travel until ProPublica broke it. I'm sure there was a lot more in the way yeah. of travel and gifts from billionaires 
to Federalist Society justices. We need to dig into this and dig into it hard, and we need to subpoena records where we need to find them. Uh, but you don't necessarily start at the end with the justice himself. You very often want to do in an investigative strategy the evidence building just the way a prosecutor would so that when you're ready to sit down with the principal, uh, you are fully prepared for that exchange. Well, I would say two things in response. Number one, you already did write a letter to John Roberts. He just ignored it and said, I'm not coming. So it's not like you haven't shown interest in getting him in front of your committee. The issue is, are you going to force him? Yeah. And the second thing I would say is, at some point then, are you saying that your committee will try and get Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas in front of a hearing so that the people can hear? You know, we're a committee. I'm not the chairman of it. And we have a, a narrow majority on the committee. So I can't predict what others will do. But you would but like to see them in front of the committee. What I can assure you of is that we take this very seriously, and I am determined to get to the bottom of what took place and make sure that the court is accountable for its misbehavior. Feel free not to speak for the committee. Only speak for Sheldon Whitehouse. Does Sheldon Whitehouse want to see Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas in the Senate in front of your committee so that the American people can hear what's going on? Very much particularly once we are well prepared for that. OK. Uh, as I noted in my monologue at the start of the show today, the Supreme Court has essentially become a group of politicians in robes, with their rulings making it more difficult to pass gun control, a raft of other legislation. They are legislating from the bench, which is what Republicans used to say was wrong for judges to do. Isn't this now a crisis of democracy, of the people's will and the people's representatives being defied again and again by unelected and clearly biased political actors, the justices? The ethics problems that we are seeing connect to uh, right-wing dark money billionaires. And what also connects to right-wing dark money billionaires is the Federalist Society list that got three of these judges appointed by Trump, the judicial uh, crisis network advertisements that were propagated all across the television to campaign for these justices' confirmations, the funding of Republican senators and of Mitch McConnell's political operation, and flotillas of briefs from front groups that are put before these justices to tell them what it is that the right-wing billionaires want. So the Essex piece is one tranche of a much bigger problem of dark money billionaire influence, which is why I call this the court that dark money built. So it's a court that dark money built, but it's also a court that Democrats could try and rebuild. They could try and rebalance. They could try and expand. It's been 50 years, Kenneth, I know you know this, since justices appointed by Democratic presidents had a majority on the court. And a new analysis by two Princeton professors suggests that conservative justices will control the court for at least the next three decades. So that's 50 years since you've had control, another 30 years since you might even get back control. Why not? try and expand the court now. And I know you've, I've asked you this before, and every time I ask you this, you say to me, now's not the time. We've got to make the argument, then make the call. When is the time, Senator? If not now, when? Well, now is completely unrealistic uh, because there's a fellow uh, over in the House who holds the Speaker's gavel, whose name is Kevin McCarthy. And the big billion-dollar donors that prop up the Republican Party are never going to let him pass a piece of legislation that expanded the court. So I have to work in the realm of the possible, and unless you have some magic spell that can be cast on Kevin no, McCarthy, on, that is on, not in on, the realm on, of the possible. On, on. Hold on. On that basis, you can't propose any legislation because McCarthy will block it all. I'm not telling you to do it now. I'm saying you go into the next election saying this is one of the policy proposals we will do if you give us control of Congress. Yeah, I think that's uh, probably... Uh, pretty reasonable proposition to take before the voters. For sure, term limits are widely accepted and is a good idea to take before the voters. And all of this ethics and transparency mess, including the mess of these fake front groups that are appearing before the court on behalf of the billionaires, those are terrific issues to take before the voters. So yes, I agree with you that we need to make this a uh, an issue in the 2024 elections. And I think little by little, particularly after the Dobbs decision, voters are coming to see that the Supreme Court isn't some arbitrary faraway thing. It's affecting their personal lives 
It's affecting their personal lives in ways that they don't like. And the explanation for what's happening is not a good one. It's an explanation of dark money influence. This month, Senator, the Senate confirmed two ACLU star lawyers to the federal bench. First, Nusrat Chowdhury, the first Muslim female federal judge, uh, as well as voting rights lawyer Dale Ho. But at the same time, isn't the blue slip tradition, which allows senators and right now especially Republican senators, to veto judicial nominees from their home states, slowing down the confirmation process, isn't that something that should be scrapped? I don't know if it should be scrapped. It certainly needs to be addressed. Bear in mind that because of population, there are a lot more district court seats that are controlled by Democratic senators, where we get to decide, because of the blue slip, who gets appointed to that position. Then there are Republican-controlled seats, where a Republican senator gets to recommend to the president. So if you take away the blue slip, you're taking away uh, a built-in structural advantage for Democrats and, of course, I think it's appropriate for home state senators to have a voice in who the lifetime district court judges are in their state. So one has to proceed with caution. The deliberate refusal to deal fairly with the Biden administration and to withhold a blue slip without merit is, I think, something that there should be consequences for, and we need to work through what those consequences should be. But I think we shoot ourselves in the foot, given the numbers, if we take away the blue slip so that the next Republican president can roll all of us, uh, and much to their advantage numerically, to be able to take on blue state seats. OK, interesting. Good response. Let me make one last, uh, put one last question to you on an unrelated issue. President Biden and the DNC have taken a vow of silence when it comes to the Trump indictment. And I understand the argument. Stay above the fray. It's a legal matter. Don't get involved. Then again, there's an election next year, and Donald Trump is likely to be the Republican presidential candidate. Shouldn't Joe Biden, as a Democratic presidential candidate, shouldn't you guys, as Democratic members of Congress, communicate to voters that the leading Republican candidate is enmeshed in multiple criminal indictments and therefore not fit for office? Politics, like nature, Senator, abhors a vacuum. Why leave a vacuum for Republicans to fill with bad faith defenses of Donald Trump? Why not point out, hey, guys, the other, le other party, their leader, is an indicted man? First of all, I think you're preaching to the choir here. I've spent a lot of time pointing all of this out. I don't think the Biden administration has sent any signal to Democrats that we should not be talking about the perils of a Trump presidency and the criminality, allegedly, of Trump's behavior. Uh, they just don't want to be involved directly because the attorney general reports to the president and the attorney general appointed the special counsel, and the special counsel brought the case. But I, I, think I understand it's wise that point, Senator. Hold their fire I, on this until I, it's more immediate to the election. So I'm not the least bit upset that Biden is standing back from this, and I don't feel the least bit constrained by the administration in going after this uh, problem set. So just to clarify then, because I just want to be clear on this, Donald Trump is going to be enmeshed in trials, court dates, indictments, going all the way up to November 2024 and maybe beyond. You accept that at some point Joe Biden, while running for re-election, will have to engage with that? DOJ, Absolutely. independence be damned. I can't wait to see that debate, for instance, if it comes to a debate. Yeah, well, let's see if Donald Trump has a time for debate in between his court appearances. <laughs> Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Good to be with you.